Anything else? Anybody know who um, Elon Musk is? Got a couple of people that don't. Okay, so <laughs> Elon Musk, just so you guys know, in the back, um, he's an unbelievable guy, right? I think like he's gonna be the, the modern day Einstein, right? When you know, take Twitter aside, right? Take that out of the side, right? The guy's building rocket ships, right? He's, he's landing people like in space, which I think is absolutely incredible. And watching some of the things that he does is, is absolutely phenomenal. What's really interesting is like when, when Teslas came out, they have this proprietary um, light in the front of the vehicle, right? Anybody ever driving a Tesla? You did? You had a Tesla. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. So the lighting system are these like LED lights, right? What's really interesting is if you go back to the 50s, and you look at the lights that are on those cars in the 50s, they only illuminate so far in front of you. 50 feet, right? Maybe 100 feet. So these vehicles are actually really interesting because they can, they can, they can show in low beams what half a city block. So professor, how big is half a city block? Think about it. Think about a, a city block in New York City. You're able to see now far in advance. So let me ask you guys a question. If you guys are traveling cross country, right? You're driving to California. Think about it from a 200 foot view perspective, right? You're driving in a Tesla. You said that you've driven in a Tesla before. You might do the, the automatic steering so you can sit back, chill, listen to my podcast or do other things like that. But what are you thinking of as you're looking through your 200 feet? What do you do if you're gonna drive cross country to California? What's, what are some steps that you could take? Maybe find where to like refuel because the electric, so. Recharge. Oh, and recharge. Yeah. Okay, all right, so find a place to recharge. It's pretty important if you're driving a Tesla, right? What else would you do? You're driving cross country. What are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, Your friend says to you, listen, I want to go to California. I want to drive the Tesla because I can see 200 feet in front of me. What are you doing? Try to stay awake. All right, try to stay awake, recharging. What else? Plan out your stops, see where you're going to sleep. Okay, plan out your stops. Yes? Drive during the day. Drive during the day because at night it's a little dangerous. What else? What do you do? You're driving cross country. Um, now, these headlights are really bright. See, very, very far in front of you. What are some things that you would look at? Signs. Okay, so you're looking at signs and you're always going to get something out of you. What are you doing? Um, I'm going to be probably looking at all the advertisements, the, the other people in the cars next to me, I'm going to get a little bit bored. So, so you're definitely having the Tesla drive for you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Fine. No problem. What are you doing? I probably want to turn the headlights off, um, in order to not to blind as our drivers. We're gonna like as well. Okay. The high beams aren't on. It's still the low beams. You can see 200 feet below low beams. Oh, 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 okay. If you're driving at night, I would not suggest that you turn the headlights out. That is a dangerous situation. Keep those on. What are you doing? That already hasn't been said. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I no, I was going to say plan stops because sleep is very important to me. But So you're going to plan stops. Okay. What are you doing? Uh, mapping out, like, the road I'm thinking and going scenic, maybe. Okay, you're mapping out. You could just go 90 west and just go just follow. But you're mapping it up. You might want to stop. What else? Loading up on the best snacks, taking food. You're going to rest stops. You're getting some snacks, right? If you're, if you're having to drive itself, you might get a couple nips here and there. Who knows? Just to keep yourself awake. I don't know. That's recorded. We'll take that off. What else? Like, you plan, like, go to, like, see different places. Yeah, okay. So you're planning a route to go see whatever's on the west, whatever's going out there. What else? Um, to know like the weather forecast. I know like, at least for myself, I'm, I like to be aware of like certain conditions. All right, so you, you map it out a little, I get a little freaky in here for a second. You map it out like the distances, the weather, all this other stuff. What else? What do you do? Uh, I'll just do auto autopilot and then I'll take a nap. Autopilot and take a nap. <laughs> 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 all 
I want to go across country with him. <laughs> yeah. Try to avoid traffic. You see some coming up and uh, further ahead. You kind of try to get off the exit. Okay. Paul, oh, what are you doing? I was just saying, probably whoever can get me there fastest. So, take so you're doing the fastest route possible. Probably, yeah. Okay. What are you doing? Stay concentrated as you don't know which drivers are on the same road as you. Someone may crash you. Uh, or they, or if, if, if you simply chill and you're not concentrated or awake, uh, there, might, there might be an inconvenient from external factors. Okay, so you're trying to stay awake. You're trying to stay alert. You're trying to stay away from all the external factors. So, I mean, what are you doing? You're traveling to California. Buddy says, let's go out there. What's your first step? What are you doing? Make a playlist. Oh, mm. oh Thank you. very nice. All right, what's... Let's not, let's not talk about the halftime show last night, but what was what's on the playlist? Uh, maybe some Mac Miller. Mac Miller? Yes. Yeah. I don't know who that is. Should I know that? Uh, it's okay, it's good stuff. I'll have to check it out later. I have no idea who that. All right, so he's he's doing a musical thing. What are you doing? Probably trying to map out the trip and see if there's any cool destinations along the way. All right, all through the headlights, guys. I think about it. You're thinking about what you can see 200 feet ahead of you. It's a right? Deer. Right? You're going you to prepare for that. You know, weather conditions, you got to prepare for that. Good music. Right? Podcasts. Unbelievable podcasts. You're looking at, you know, rest stops. You're looking at, you haven't said anything. What are you doing when you drive? Cross country. What are we doing? Probably, I'm going to drive to the airport. Hey, what? <laughs> so I would suggest, guys, that if you think about it from this perspective, okay, if you think about it from this perspective, in sales, okay, in sales, you have a, and yes, this is, this is happening, in sales, you have a 200-foot headlight when you're in front of a customer. It's the same thing as if you're traveling across country. So you guys just listed 17,000 things that you could do when you're traveling across country. Now you have an opportunity to be in front of a customer. What does your 200 feet look like? What are you doing? You're actually asking me or? Yes. Right. <laughs> um, so the spotlight is on you. I said yeah. it's wrong. We're going to do that wrong. I'm glad I'm not Apple after that. What are you doing? So you're looking, you're looking to identify ways that you can close this customer. All right. You're looking for ways to close this customer. What else are you doing? Um, I'm trying to get to know them, uh, personal relationships, know their family, their friends, that kind of stuff. Close them, personal relationships, try to get to know them personally. What else are you doing? Looking at different options for them. Like maybe it's not that one product, like seeing if they don't need that one, like pulling from your arsenal of products you have available or services, like what is best suited for them and kind of taking them down that route. Try to fit their needs, right? Curtail your message to fit their needs. What else are you doing? You're actively listening. All right, you're listening. Huge, vital. What else are you doing? Study the product that they're currently using. Okay. See what the competition is, right? What else are you doing? Make sure you don't move the focus of light. So like with the hospital and the doctor, uh, you still keep that focus on the customer and not move it elsewhere. Okay. What else? Reading their body language and just trying to interpret like what they're feeling. Okay. Um, I think not only trying to like get to know them, but letting them get to know you so that you have like a trust relationship. Building trust, right? What else? What else are we doing? Uh, I mean, just kind of like trying to identify like what ways like your product can help them. Like see, um, like how like your product is kind of like applicable to like their life or like identifying solutions they might not know about being solution oriented all right what else what else are we doing what's your 200 foot feet look like when you're in front of a customer you know you have to plan first and then execute it make a plan then execute right what are, what are we doing uh moving to the next step of your plan literally planning out your next sentence and you know is it going to be good enough is it going to have the, the punch that you intended to have that's all right, moving to the next plan. Go ahead. Listening. We got that. What and else? Planning out any like problems or questions that the customer may have about the product and how you would answer them. Okay. What do you got? What's your 200 feet feet look like? Making a story or telling a compelling story. All right. Storytelling. Preparing like for any objections that they may have to your product or like price. 
All right. What do you got? Bring an emotional appeal. Emotional appeal. Trying to find out what they think outside of business so that we can, you know, relate on, on that note as well. Connecting, building rapport. Narrow their options so that it helps them in their decision making. All right. Other options? What are you doing? Uh, yeah, just get, you know, get a sense of kind of what's going to work um, and make a sales pitch based off uh, what you feel instead of going in with like, like one specific plan. All right. Have contingency options should it become available. All right. What else? Think about what's 300 feet ahead and also about how you're going to do the closure. So you're thinking about putting the high beams on? <laughs> Could be, yeah, exactly. Oh, next level. I'll have to add that in for next semester. See if we can get this really, really going, right? <laughs> but yeah, you always have to look further than that, right? The 200 feet is a great metaphor to use, but you have to have something in case there is something down the road. It's a great point. It's a great point. What else? What else? What's your 200 feet look like? Um, probably just ask them a lot of questions to see if you can kind of identify any needs that they might, might not like outright tell you. All right. The movie, The Salesman. The movie, The Salesman. You had four distinct characters. Let me take this off. You had four distinct characters. And I got a lot of your feedback based upon these four characters. Okay. What was their 200 feet? Well, um, I noticed a lot of the time they just kind of approached like, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm from the church. And then they they would like talk for a little bit and then go straight into trying to sell it. And they would, their, their approach was like, all right, here's what we have to offer and this is why you should get it. Okay. Some of them. Some of them. Yeah. Some of them, right? Yeah. What was their 200 feet? That's um, mainly because I can't remember the names. Um, so Paul... Paul Brennan, um, he was kind of more talkative. And so his whole 200 feet was more like um, just getting more information out of his, whoever he was talking to. He was really big into, you know, building rapport. Um, so, so time up. Yeah. So Paul Brennan, when I asked you guys who you most resonated with, show of hands, who most resonated with this guy? Higher, so I can see them. All right, three of you, four, three and a half of you. All right. So before you go on with your answer, why? Well, first off, because like I actually care about the other person. Like I want to get to talk to them and understand like what their interests are, like what they do outside of whatever I'm talking about. Okay. Who else had their impacts? Did you have what why did this guy resonate with you? I thought he was quite effective on the way he was talking and he didn't want to kind of like waste time per se, either his or the one of his customer. Uh, was he successful? Mm, no, yeah. I mean, the fact, it, 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 like I saw a few that were and other cells that weren't. Okay, so keep reading. Like the next person? Yeah. Um, yeah, next up, I got um, Charles McDevitt. Um, more, his like 200 feet, he's more into like flexing his biblical knowledge and like talking about the Bible and what it means to who he's selling to. And so he focused more on the Bible itself and like what's a part of it that I can relate back to me or back to your life where, where it's going to make you realize that you have a big connection to this book. Um, I don't know. He wasn't as successful. All right. So we have three and a half people matriculated over towards the Badger, right? Who resonated or who had this? Who re the Gipper. He resonate with people. You say no. Why? Well, I mean, and not he wasn't my number one. I would say like he was my like debatable one. Okay. You say yes. What? Um in one of the beginning scenes, the what was it? The baker, he uh was kind of pushing what I thought was more product strategy to the customer, but the gipper was also in on the same customer, but he was making more of a relationship strategy, I thought, um, telling them, oh, I love how this product is going to be give value to your family. And he, he made it more to, about the customer. And I thought, I actually kind of disagreed with what he was saying. I thought he was more 
relationship driven versus Brennan. And so you can read, you can agree to disagree. That's that's why we do this because you have four distinct characters that are featured throughout this movie, right? Now I would push back and say I don't think that this dad was so successful, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But think about the characters that you saw. So you had your hand up. I was for the Jipper too. Why? Um, just there was one scene that like stuck out to me. Um, I think he was talking to the Badger, but it was like. He was saying that one of the women that I talked to was like a tough, um, like kind of sell. And the St. Paul Brenner uh, immediately was like, oh, yeah, like she wasn't. He was just talking like he couldn't make the sale where he was like, no, she was tough, but I was able to like relate her. And similar to what he was saying, like, I feel like he did a good job at like creating that connection. And he was like quieter. He wasn't like the badger where he was like always kind of talking. And even though he might have like had the right idea, I think the badger spoke too much where the giver is like, like I could relate to because knowing when it's time to speak up and when it's time to kind of sit and like kind of read your audience. All right. Yeah. Um, I thought he was like super successful. I think it said like he like tripled his sales for the year and he did that by like relationship building. So like even at one point he says, I hope it brings you lots and lots of joy. And, like focus on like the emotional aspect of the person. And he even like sat down on the couch a few times and like just got very comfortable with the people that he was selling to and then like pitched it. The giver. Yeah. Yeah. I look at him, the word that I would use to describe him, and I don't know if you guys agree with this, he was old school. Old school. I felt like there was a little bit of a charm with him as far as how he dressed, his mannerisms, how he went into the, the houses, <laughs> even how he spoke to his, his compadres there. It was more like an old school feeling with him. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I had um, Paul before. Right. Not for the, yeah, not for um, the Gipper. All right. What about him? Well, I thought he was, like, the most, like, genuine. He knew when to kind of, like, he wasn't as pushy as the other guys. I thought the other guys were a little, like, they were strictly, like, whether the people they were selling to had, like, financial issues, they were still pushing away, where this guy kind of, like, like started to have some empathy towards the people he was actually selling to, and that definitely didn't lead to his success all the time, but he seemed, like, the most genuine and still... In a way telling the story so, so his 200 feet was what um it, well i thought it was for his 200 feet it would probably be like storytelling in a sense but not as like it was he he did a lot of the analogy with the irishmen or like the polish people and like he was more focused on understanding the people he was talking to and then going from there. So he tried to relate it to like a group of people. And then I think that was more right. 200 feet. Uh, in all honesty, I thought he was pretty terrible at what he did. Um, to the effect of the storytelling part, it seemed like he just went on too long. He was talking to one of his clients about how the book was so great and about how he sold it to somebody with a PhD insinuating that smart people buy from him. But then he related it over to how he graduated cum laude and then he just kept going on a tangent. He, it seemed like he was the epitome of a bad salesman where he wasn't listening at all. He just kept talking. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't think they were all exceptional. Like they're, they're selling Bibles to people that couldn't afford them. I thought they're all pretty, they're a bunch of, like, I mean, the same concept of like the vacuum salesman, he, like the guy met, the, one of the guys met the, like the other vacuum salesman. He's like, I know what you're, you guys are all about. I do the same stuff. Like, so. All right. Keep going. Next guy. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, we have James Baker. He's been brought up. He's the rabbit. He, um, his 200 feet, he was, he was following a script the whole time, wasn't he? Like, like I thought of the four, he deviated like the least from it seems like this cookie cutter like his next thing was just the next line in the script and for me that was kind of kind of a I, I didn't like it as much you guys agree with that usually agree with you a lot I definitely don't right maybe now. I got my names mixed I, up or something I think we're talking I said Paul Brennan was successful I, got I think you think you might have done that be the way I interpreted James especially from that first scene he was selling more the emotional appeal. He was going through about how the it's a 10, 10 register font, basically. It's a lot easier to see. He was relating it back to how it was it was tough for him to view these things. And then with the 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 woman who couldn't speak English as well, he was trying to relate it more about how it could help the children learn. It was it was more relationship and less product. Kitchen scene. 
when he's in the kitchen, he hits his head on the uh, on, on the light, right? Awkward moment. But think about that whole sales, that whole sales scene, right? In that scene, the prospect goes, oh, now you're part of the family. When he, when he hits his head off the light. And like, right. that's, I don't know that, because I resonated most with this guy. I think that's just kind of the epitome of like what he was as a person. Because he was also like the youngest of the group. And like the more like, I would argue like immature one of the group, but like still got it done. Like when he needed to. All right. Um, I would say he's more like feature focused. He's like the 10 point font. And like he was showing like the beauty of the book, like I guess he was selling. And then he just kept on um, saying like, oh, you could see how this could fit into your lifestyle. Like going back to like the English thing, like teachers in English. Like he was very much like, I guess, features oriented of what this could do for you. Not how, not necessarily like how you need it, what it could do for you. Right. As opposed to, I believe, Brennan, talking about how many people had bought it at the church yeah right that wasn't working um i also said that i resonated most with the so, sh so show of hands the round who, who resonated this most with Iron. all right good enough go ahead um mainly because he i totally agree with the like i think he used a more emotional approach to it he used um i heard him use a couple jokes like about the like his sales pitch. And then I remember one of the scenes when he was pitching to, I think it was a man and wife. And I think the wife's friend came in the door or something. And like, I don't, he wasn't really selling to the friend, but still was asking like what her name is and like stuff about her and not just kind of like dismissing her and building rapport. Like, yeah, it made it feel like yeah. she was a part of it, even like it really matters to him. Or yep. His pitch. yep. Who else? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like he also have just had a lot of charisma, like similar to Paul, but just not as ex extreme, in my opinion. Um, and also in that scene, he was like complimenting the husband and like, I feel like he just understood who he was talking to so well. Um, so again, back to like the emotional aspect of like relationship building, I feel like he was the best at that. All right. What about this guy? What'd you notes about? Well, if these notes are correct these here. Are, these are not good notes. Um, they're, they're hastily written, but I had him as kind of just aggressive. Like his whole thing was just closing and he seemed kind of um, desperate. To, to get to a close. Like there are several scenes where it felt like he was, he was just trying to do a hard sell and it just wasn't working for him. Anybody disagree? I agree, but I also think at the same time, he did have a lot of like, I feel like he used humor and, and he was also pretty charismatic. Um, but I thought like I resonated with him, but I also would have been like a lot more apprehensive in moments where he was really pushy and like he was really um determined yeah like he said to close but even if they didn't like like very clearly didn't have the money um like he wanted his customer to find money where like there was no money just because he wanted to sell check money order cash didn't yeah. matter credit card at that particular time we're, we're getting it from anywhere which is like you got to keep in mind this bible costs fifty dollars but it's in 1969. Right. I did an inflation calculator just for like, just to see what it, this cost $400. Whoa. They're buying a book. Not just a book. It's a book. The book. It's a book. <laughs> and they're spending $400 and this money. That they, that's and cool. he's saying like, find them. I'm, like I don't like this guy. That's like a textbook. Yeah, I, was really like, yeah. I resonated with this guy too, because he seemed like very, he almost had two sides of his personality, even like a businessman where he wanted to make sure like the sales were there. Um, he put on like this professional front, but he also had like a side of loyalty and like a, a soccer side on the other, other side of his personality where he took the other guy under his wing, kind of taught him the rope, like the ropes of the business. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of why I resonated with him because he had a business side, but then he also had like a little bit more of a personal side. All right. So we got all four of them. So how do we re relate this back to A, communication styles? How do we relate this back to what we were talking about from a sales perspective, effective self? Well, speaking on the Badger, I agree with, I think Andrea said it, that he was not effective in his selling. And like the thing that stood out to me the most was like, he used a lot of excuses specifically with like the territory and like that kind of, I related it to class when we had the TED talk where she was like, if you're the link, like you can change yourself to like fit the situation. It's not just like the outside like factors that are causing it. So yeah, excuses, right? So Paul Brennan, thinking about some of the questions we could really gain from this, 
What character do you feel most aligned with? I think we did that, but I think we got that out of the way. How do you relate these interactions to effective selling? We saw what good looks like. We saw what okay looks like, right? We saw some of the interactions and how they unwinded. How could Brennan have done things differently? If you were managing this gentleman right here, how could you have managed him better from a sales perspective? No right or wrong answers. You're a sales manager. You got this guy as your rep. What do you do? Um, I feel like he's just, you got to tell him he has to win the mental game because he doesn't handle failure well at all. And it just keeps getting kind of worse until he becomes this just uncomfortable character. And he doesn't resonate with anybody else around him anymore, any of the other salesmen. So I feel like just getting him to win the mental battle is the biggest thing for him. All right. Mental battle. Try to get him over the edge from a mental perspective. Yeah. I think a big thing is like for all of them is selecting like their personnel, like go to like, like there's obvious, like they seem to be targeting like lower class people that just can't afford this like high end book. I mean, they're trying to take a loan, like they're basically taking loans out for a book, like they're doing payment plans for a book. I, I think they should be like targeting a different audience for this. And I think that's their direction is just in the wrong place. All right. But remember, the direction was driven by their district manager. Yeah. Remember that whole interaction down in Florida? Yeah, I, wrote, I briefly like wrote about that. Like their, like their whole thing is like, there. it was kind of ironic that their sales person is selling to them, like the whole thing. Like they, they were all being sold by their own salesman to sell this Bible. They're all, I don't know, but it's just. Oh, yeah. So weird concept. I, mean, I, I agree. It's also a little messed up. But besides the point, if I was like district uh, manager or something, I'd give tips on like how to instead of storytelling, maybe um, ask more questions or like listen to understand. Where I felt like he was strong in the sense of storytelling, but wasn't actually directing it to the respective minds. All right, last one. Just to kind of like go off that, I wouldn't say like give up on the storytelling aspect, especially if like that was like his strength. So like play to your strength, but also be able to balance it with like listening and let them talk and ask questions. So this guy right here, thank you. This guy right here is probably who the film is all about. Centrally focused character, right? It's a bad streak, right? He hits a bad streak. And instead of focusing the, the movie, on the success that these other three have had, this guy was my favorite. When we talk about who I aligned with, it was more along the lines of the rabbit. Certainly he was great. He has his own way of doing things, but the, the, the movie focuses on this guy and his bad streak. Instead of focusing on the success that those other three had, focuses on the failure that he had, right? How do you, how do you then get out of that failure? In sales, we talk so much about success and how great it is. But there's some shitty times too in sales. Pardon me. Right? And you got to understand that. Like, this guy's going through it in real time. He's going back to the hotel room. He's trying to make excuses. He doesn't know why he can't get anybody to buy. Right? So he's complaining. It's negative. There's a negativity loop that he keeps on trying to talk to the others about. And if you, if you saw in one of those scenes, these guys didn't want to hear it anymore. They had it. They're like, all right, we're done. We're going to go out and sell. So his 200 feet got, got all caught up because he couldn't sell. That's going to happen. That's real life. Right? And I think uh, whoever said it earlier, what's the next 200 feet going to look like? after that, right? Sales, we've proven, is like flying a plane. We've talked about how you guys have uh, an ability to be magicians in creating these relationships. Think about how he could have done that a little bit differently. Sprinkled that pixie dust on those relationships while he's sitting there in the room with them. And now we've seen that sales what was I going to I just had a really good thought. I can't, re I can't remember it right now. The characters that you see here, right? We have to close the loop, all right? So with that, here's what I need from you. I need you to start here. We'll do the same thing around, up that way, and then up that way, count off by sixes. One, two, three, four, 
Six, one. Okay, perfect. One's over here. Clear the tables. One's over here. Two's up there. Three's here. Four's there. Five's there. Six is over here. Okay. Yes, sir, no. Okay, no, four. No, no, yeah, let's go. you guys all too? It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, yo, we were on the same Yeah, yeah. All right. All right, here we go. You ready? All right, here's what we're going to do. Team building is such a critical part of sales and selling. Life connecting with people, building something to structure together. Okay, so here's what we're going to do we have the rules right here, they're all written out for you to read as a team. Okay, <laughs> hold on. You what? I don't wear glasses. Is that better? Surely, somebody on that team can read that and maybe decipher it for you. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. You got the rules right here. You have until uh, 7.50, 7.50. So here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna build a spaghetti tower only with those ingredients that you have at your disposal. Now, we like to give out prizes in this class. Last semester, I believe the top one from table to tabletop was I believe 67 inches. So 67 inches, just so you guys can see how big the spaghetti tower was. Oh. It was about there, 57 inches, excuse me. Okay. From the table to the height. Now, the rules are here. I want to know diameter. The rules are here. You have until 750. So figure out how your build is going to go, what it looks like. What it feels like, how will you build the biggest tower? The prize, for the team that wins, you can crush those. Yeah, absolutely. You can definitely crush those. There is a prize for the team that wins. I will. Okay, get started. Oh, you already want to say that. We have to write it down. We need a wide base, but not like too wide to bring up too much more material. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like this. These are going to be kind of heavy. Yeah, it's the top. Awesome. Big free aesthetics. We need a big thing. Oh, wait. A leader. Are you ready? Best way. Be fearless. Uh, uh, marshmallow. Can you Oh, is it a leader? Do know. Because this comes up every semester. The entire marshmallow must be on top of the structures. 
Like one marshmallow? So we can break the Yeah, it can't ripple. No, but I think that's. I think that's the one I Professor, here's the question. Let me get this one like a tiny little piece of it, like everything in the middle of the salad. I don't think they need to because you need a strong base, you slide on the top. No, use as many or as few of the five your team choose, with the exception of the marshmallows. Uh, yeah. That's got great. We got to get it over here. So, uh, be used in the structure. Oh. They don't have to do the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Come on, Brad. Let's see what you got, kid. Let's try it out or something. Like, that's something. Yeah, I'm thinking like, just like that might not be there. how do we want to do it? Like, we want to have a structure like types and then lead into like one top structure. I have some stick. I have some stick. Oh, uh, box of yeah. like, uh, from the table up, not the ground up, table up. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can like take the side. Okay. Uh, uh, so I so do think that you know I mean so we use like four individual modular shots here on each of those. Yeah. So like we need I need a rat to make this series. Hey, are we have sticks? What about them? Yeah, we have to split them in the other thing. We want a rage. But I think it makes it big only supplies with this. Yeah, it's giving the same stuff, but it's it's not the same size. for the bottom, it should probably be. Yeah, I got to leave too with me. Yeah, I was yeah. Yeah, we gotta go straight. I, I honestly, I think we should go like out somewhere. Um, that's what we can do. Because if it's, it's uh, maybe not, yeah. If it's heavier, I feel like we can tape the week. Like it needs to be like this. Oh, okay. Why? Maybe there is a foot. Maybe these are Yeah, yeah. All gotta be the same. Yeah, they, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Like we gotta like film them like on top of each other. You know what I'm saying? I like that. I like that. Also, you can do another one. You can make more. Oh, and like the monopoly like spread out. We can go for it. I think we can go. It all depends on like a wide, yeah, a wider, stronger base, and then ever should be going. That's five. You guys five. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
This is group five. I, I didn't know. Oh, 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 Sorry. I like it. Yeah, I feel like so we're gonna yeah. So we're gonna yeah. It's yeah. Oh, sorry, we said sex. My bad. Sex. My bad. My bad. I was five. Yeah. But they all have to be the same. Yeah, yeah, because as it gets higher, oh, it goes up and down to the last head. Yeah, so like when we get to the top, until it's like the actual no, top, top one, actually. Let's say, wait, say, um, this is our top uh, one. We gotta rip all the other ones like on his ass. Question Can we get a search? that are like this structure, like not the top. Yes. Um, yes, okay. Yeah. No, 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 that is that is the winning strategy. The marshmallow's in the middle. Like, those three each other, one on top, two on the Yeah, as long as the, you have a free floating one on the top. I'm asking a great question early on in the process. Because I think with that one, like, we can still just like, fall. Yeah, we're going to fall. I think we go. So I think if you make a box here, yeah, it's like all of these, and then we can bring all of them together and start to be like one tower. I think that like no, keep. I think that's the good. Yeah, this is that's right. Wait, why is that a double base? Yeah, I've literally, I've stacked like so many of them. Yeah. Think about how much we have. We have a lot. Yeah, we're gonna. We should take anything that will. Yeah, we're gonna take yeah. I think I think we're gonna need to take a few, but you should. Yeah. Are we gonna connect all of the individual? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We should do an hour. Structurally, how does that look? Yeah, we could do that. It's a stagger. The first connection of the base is up here. We are waiting. We are wasting a little bit of. Yeah, this should be our last I mean, can I do like we get a good seven minutes? Twenty minutes. Seven thirty. Seven thirty. We have to like wait for sentences. Like, I think you can. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Wait, wait. 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 Wait, there are no, or even if we just want to okay. Oh, you're good. Like, who would be nice and an excellent little? Yeah, but like, maybe if we did like what I don't know. Which way? Yeah, it was I think we should make a strong. Yeah, there's already a couple that are in half. Levels with.
Yeah, we do it all I guess. And how many do you want to do? Yeah, I do want to see yeah, 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 all right. All right. Yeah, 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 we gotta start connecting all four of these. Yeah, I think the bottom no, I don't think that's gonna stay. I don't think that's a wide enough base to I think we just gotta start connecting like red get everything to like the edge use each other's support yeah i'm going to start building up yeah that's also like i yeah, so yeah, we have to keep on building up. Yeah, so yeah, we have to keep what if we have better ideas? What if we put like, like seven years, and then team with like five? Yeah, we have some team with one. I think we have to like think about it. Do you want to try it? We don't have to. Just go on every house. Yeah, like what's this thing? Sorry, go on. Try it. Yeah, like sort of. That thing is going to be my favorite. We use them as tests. I think we should have more time. Now, we want to make these straight up and down like a square. I feel like if we get one too low, then it would be a yeah, uh, so I feel like we're 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 yeah, I'm with building sign. What is the box thing? What is the I think I also think that cross. We don't go enough. We don't go enough. We don't go enough. We don't go I'm really scared if we don't have a strong base that we can't just yeah. Oh, yeah. I like that. Oh, I like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that's what I was talking about. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, stagger puts all right. So, yeah, yeah. all the yeah, sort of the Maybe just to have shown how it was about the degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, the Elsa hat. Okay. I wish. It's better than the other Wait, I can put this on top. Yeah. This we need to make one that Okay, we just build where is it? Where is it going? Where is it falling? Yeah, we're We got to do it. I think that's what our cross brace. I think go and build another box. So, we need that like it's done. You got to see if it's done. I want to see where is it all going. I don't think that will be in the I I'm trying something. Maybe the last second is the first I asked. If we keep ripping them, this one will be fine. So connect each of the four split corners to one TP, and then we're going to connect the TP to one TP. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 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 
Uh oh. Yeah, I she it. got up. I she it. means business now. <laughs> oh, yeah, we can plan it. It took us 15 minutes. Yeah, Eight minutes. Do you mind seven and a half minutes? I will. Well, then, should we tape them? Because we didn't do Marshmallow Wars. Wait, wait. Here, give me all these tape guys. I think we need these tape right here. I'm going to use these. Just uh, a it's it's bad bad. Yeah, it's yeah, it's funny that you can the Another box, I'm going to take that home. I didn't realize it was that. It together best so you don't have That's why I selected that. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're on our own thing. Yeah. Hold this for a second. Really. Look, I'm going to be right we need to figure out the time. <laughs> 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 Well, we need to put one of the here. So, if this happens, we need to. Okay, I'm going to take it. 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 I'm that's going to go now, right? Yeah, they're going to like. It's following the work. Right, what happens here? Oh, I, I, yeah, I took the last second stab on something. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Just has to be so. Yes. I wouldn't even do anything. I think, I mean, it's standing perfectly by itself yes. right now. But it's perfect, like this. But it's still perfect, but it's, it's standing. Because you can get over time. It's not. Two minutes. It's not a good thing. That's all right. Still, there are only a verse spell that can sit on top. Standing tower. I mean, 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 I m
Mike, listen up. Let's talk. Let's get up. Boys, you're done. Oh, quick. What do we got? 29 inches right here. All right, this is group four. Oh, boy. Oh, no. No. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Go get it up there. Go going down. 25. Go right there. Trust us. This is just a lot this I want to jump to the Extra chocolate. Why they are? I can tell you. Try it again. Try it again. Try it again. Try it again. If it didn't sag at the end, it would have had a It's still staying. <laughs> This group, that group, that group, do me a favor and just start putting that stuff right in here, okay? Because we're going to start cleaning up, all right? Because we got two guests coming in five minutes. So get together over here. So 29, almost 30 inches, very close, but there was a demerit. It did move it. No. Oh, oh, no. It's it's so it. Yeah. 20 and a half, right here. All right. Back on. Hey, what about the third I'm doing it. Oh. Right. So, okay, do you what we got to do? What? What did one? Send me the names. All right, send me an email with all the names. Right. So as we clean up, let's do it. As we clean up, sure, I'll get you guys Dunkin' Donuts gift card. Sorry. Listen up. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Listen up. Listen up. Listen up. Team building. Why do we do this? Think about how you relate this back to effective selling. Why do we build a spaghetti tower? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You need a bat? Yeah. Uh, we'll get it. Teamwork and communication. What else? What else? Problem solving. Stress. Time limits. Adversity. What else? Dealing with failure. Problem solving. What else? Time management. Time management, team strategy, roles. What? Roles. different roles, defined roles. I heard you taking an active role. I heard you guys over here taking an active role. I heard more leaders coming out, right? How we build a sustainable structure. What else? We say your concerns. Yeah, we have a bag. We, we share bags. Okay. Voicing your concerns. Voicing concerns, right? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What else? Your plan not yeah. going as expected. Right? Plan not going as expected. Uh, creativity, adapting to different needs. Yeah, here we go. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, all right. <laughs> so here's what we're gonna do. Let's clean. Let's clean the tables off. We got a winner. All right. We got five minutes right now. If you guys gonna do wash your hands. Get the marshmallows off. Come back in at eight o'clock because we got two guests that are gonna come in right now. I need. I need a volunteer. One volunteer. Yeah. All right. Your first question is gonna be to Josh Halpern. And you're going to ask him, tell me the story or tell us the story about defrosting the chicken. That's the only question you can ask him. Okay? Thank you. All right, let's go. Eight o'clock. Yeah, you can get rid of it now. Seriously. Yeah, no, not at all. Not at all. Okay, so. Any chance I can get. Yeah, I'm not sure. Great team effort. Oh, I, 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 I wouldn't want to work. Be the one that cleans up. You know what I mean? You think the team that wins should clean up? The last place. I think we should cost these around so that way we can have a little. I'm down with that. Wait, I want to try to catch one in my mouth. <laughs> I think we won. I think we won the uh, messiest team. We won that. There's so much yeah, spaghetti everywhere. Yeah, there's just smoke. Yeah. Josh Schneider, Josh, I am bringing it this early. We are just finishing up our uh, spaghetti yeah. conversation this evening. Give me a couple minutes, not even. These guys are going to be ready to rock and roll for you. Matt, can you grab the shot back? Oh, yeah, yeah. Josh, you in Vegas uh, or no? Grittiest team. Well, grittiest team. Hey, Zab. You're on mute. You will break. Zab, grittiest team right here. You know what? I would expect nothing less from you guys being the greatest team on paper. Can you guys hear me? There we go. Maybe we can. Oh, sure. Maybe we have a It's just a woman in the I think all they can hear the cameras. <laughs> 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 They, uh, oh. I guess they should be what we, yeah. I guess we both so, know each other. Can you hear me? I need papers on here, bro. I can. Okay, perfect. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's get back into it. Let's get back into it. All right, let's go. Let's get back into it. <laughs> Uh, I have some of the rest of my stuff. All right, we're going to operate this the same way that we've operated the last few weeks. I think you guys know what the expectation is. Okay, we have a question. Come up here and introduce yourself. Tell the gentleman what uh, what your name is what your class is, and what your major is. You're here to learn from them, to ask them questions, and they're gonna provide you with some unbelievable answers to your questions, all right? Um, with that being said, who wants to start it off? It's not cheese. Want to that question? No, with another one. You, are, you ready to rock? Oh yeah. All right, come on up. Okay. <laughs> Put you on the spot. All right, you ready to go? Thank you, Josh. Thank you, John, for coming in. Floor is yours. Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, I just have a question about if you could tell me about um defrosting a chicken. Uh -huh. defrost the chicken. <laughs> yeah, so I see this question was planted for me. I appreciate that, Zev. <laughs> so the defrost the chicken story, and Zev gave you the punchline, unfortunately, to the story. It's uh, it's one of the things I believe the most in sales and in business, right? So before there were computers or, or flight simulators, um, believe it or not, they would actually fling dead chickens at airplanes. 
right? Because one of the most dangerous moments for a plane on takeoff or on landing is if a bird hits the plane. If a bird hits the propeller, if a bird gets sucked into the engine, it, it knocks out the plane. And many planes have crashed because a, a bird basically screws up the plane, right? So back in the 70s, there was a railway conference and the train company said, uh, hey, we want to borrow this chicken catapult from you, right? And they borrow this chicken catapult and the train conductor goes out and here comes this bird and it comes flying across and three, two, one, bam, straight through the windshield of the train, straight through the back of the first car of the train, through three rows of seats and it embeds itself right, in the back of the second car. And everybody's panicked, right? The physicists can't explain why the, the bird did that. They can't explain the trajectory of it. So then they start to blame procurement. You sold us shitty materials. You sold us a bad train. The glass was bad. This was bad. That was bad. Then they started to blame the conductor, right? The conductor didn't break hard enough. Maybe the conductor broke too hard. They're blaming everybody, everything. And they can't figure out why the train is destroyed. So they send binders and binders and binders to Airbus with all of their research, trying to figure out why everything was destroyed. And back came a one-page letter, dear sir or madam, please defrost the chicken, right? They send a cannonball of poultry through a moving train. And I use that example, that story, that parable a lot with sales. And, you know, I, I used to run a $7.4 billion business for sales that, you know, I mean, we had to grow by, you know, $300 million a year. And this notion of when you're selling, the simplest explanation is normally the right one, right? Everybody wanted to go five steps downfield. You know, why was this chain messed up? But at the end of the day, it was the simplest thing that prevented them from hitting their goals, right? And in any sales, in any negotiation, in any process with planning, you need to back all the way up to the beginning because each step you take from your first one is one more reason why you ended up in a really weird place and couldn't close the deal. You always have to defrost the chicken. Keep it simple. Keep it stupid. Keep it great. Thank you for that planted question. I appreciate you. Next. Hello, good afternoon. So I'm Max, I'm an exchange student from Spain. And my question is, um, in your opinion, how do you achieve mastery in the world of sales or how do you keep growing as a professional nowadays? Is that one for me or for, for John? I would like to know both of your opinions. The main. All right, John, you want to kick off? Sure. Um, thank you so much for the, for the question, Max. Um, I think something that really helps me all the time is, is staying generally curious uh, about the customer. I got in, in my business, uh, patients um, really staying focused on learning about everything that that person, why they got into the business, why they're doing what they're doing, how they're doing it, and really caring. Um, that makes my day different every day when I go out into, into the world and, and talk to my customers and learn from them. And it makes it exciting for me. And if I can show that passion and really care to them, um, I think every day becomes a learning opportunity for myself, whether it's in oncology or in any of the institutions that I'm dealing with, learning and becoming a, a, a genuine student of the world and how it operates and all the changes that we've went through in these last three or four years, I don't think anybody has an answer. So I'm generally cur curious to see how I can get better. Um, you know, 1% better every day for me is a win. Uh, some days I'm going to take a step back, but if I can go out there and be genuinely curious and learn something in the day, it's a win for me. And that forces me to get better each and every day. I like your answer a lot. I'm going to steal yours. <laughs> yeah. You know, for, for me, 
there's nobody sitting at a, at home like, hey, I hope tomorrow some guy comes and sells X to me, and it would be great if this random sales guy found me, right? No, no one's saying that. So you could either approach people like you want to be their partner or their pimp, for lack of a better term, right? And if you approach people with the notion of partnership every day, right, it's not a, just a transaction. It's it's you're in this with them. They're going to be that much more willing to follow you, to listen to you, because they know that you're trying to make them better. You're not just trying to hit a quota, right? The other thing I would say is uh, on the pursuit of mastery of sales, um, you know, my first sales job ever, my, my dad is crazy, right? So before I went to college, he made me sell long distance phone service door to door in Brooklyn, New York, back before Brooklyn was cool. Like it was dangerous back in the 90s, right? And one of the things I learned is, you know, there are four impulse factors that govern all sales, right? And you need to know which one of those four impulse factors or what combination of those impulse factors are going to work on the person you're talking to because people are different, right? And the four impulse factors are fear of loss, indifference, greed, and sense of urgency. And, uh, you know, fear of loss being like, oh, come on, if, if I, I if, you know, if you don't do this, you're going to be missing out. You don't want all of your friends to think that you're missing out. You know, um, greed to be like, hey, if it's good enough for John, it should be good enough for you too, right? Sense of urgency. I need to know in the next 10 minutes or the deal is off. I've always sold with indifference, right? That's really been where my, my competitive advantage came in, Um you know, I, I now work for Shaquille O'Neal. I, I think you guys probably know that about me. And, uh, you know, I got to know Shaquille through his agent, Perry, when we did um, Beer Park by Budweiser at the Paris Hotel out in Vegas. And Perry said that I completely like screwed with his mind during the negotiation because Perry would be like, we need to do A or the deal's off. And then the deal's off. It's okay. You don't want to do this deal with me? No, no. I absolutely want to do this deal with you. But if I need to do A to do the deal... It's okay, deal's off. And in doing that, he started selling against himself, right? Because he needed, he wanted to close the deal. He knew I wanted to close the deal, but didn't quite understand why I wasn't willing to be the pushy salesman, why I wasn't willing to beat my chest and start yelling and all of those things. As they started to build the business with Shaquille, they said they really needed that type of negotiation more because we were working with these franchise partners who um, would rely on us for partnership and needed that indifference more than that beat the chest, fear of loss, sense of urgency type approach. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I actually had a second question that I would like to ask. Um, is there any type of uh, moto? I'm a big moto type of guy with my, my proverbs and stuff, like, and stuff like that. So is there a, a moto that you would kind of like say to yourself every day or some type of like work philosophy in some type of like sentence or so that you would like to share to us as some type of advice? We already covered mine. It's to frost the chicken. Uh, so no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll let John go. <laughs> and what about John? Yeah, I, I think for me is, is I just ask myself every day, what, what type of legacy am I gonna leave, right? Um, you know, I, I really wanna leave a mark on this world, especially engaging with, the patient's lives, you know, every day I get up and I just say, what do I want to accomplish? What kind of legacy do I want to live today? And just getting up every day and, and having that as my motto, having that, you know, live and be true. That's kind of what drives me because every decision that I'm going to make, every effort that I'm going to put into, right? If it comes back to that, I know I'm going to give a hundred percent. I know I'm going to push through it. I know I'm going to do anything that I want because it's bigger than me, right? It, it's what can I, what can I show my kids? Hey, I'm the person that I said I was going to be uh, to my family. I'm the person I said I'm going to be. This is what I'm going to do today. No matter if it gets rough, tough, ends, COVID, what, whatever took place, right? Uh, that, that's how I get up and, and live my day every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Hey, gentlemen. My name is Andrew. Nice to meet you guys. Um, I had kind of a two-part question. So first off, have you found it to be a bit different when you're selling to different generations? And if so, how has it been in your experience to sell to more younger generations like millennials or even Gen Z? Have you seen any disparities? How does that go with you guys? I want to hire you for asking that question, I, honestly. Um, 
I, I actually just gave a speech talking to a couple hundred people on how if you're not individually catering to Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, and Gen Alpha, you've already lost, right? Um, because at the end of the day, the thing that's so unique about these four generations in particular, well, there's a few things, right? First off, the way the, the level of digital nativity is dramatically different. And as a result of that, the communication norms between generations are dramatically different. Um, we actually are launching a consumer loyalty program March 1st. It's in beta right now, where different generations will actually be able to choose how they interact with our loyalty program. Because most loyalty programs, which is a sales mechanism when you think about it, most loyalty programs are Gen X digital punch cards. And that has no relevance on the life of Gen Zs like yourselves and really no relevance on the life of Gen Alpha, right? So I think this notion of one-to-one -one relationships in a digitally native world is only going to get stronger. And, and part of that is gonna be understanding the generational cohorts and where that comes from. Your generation was so influenced by the 2008 economic crisis. The idealism that you guys have is way less than the idealism that millennials had. And that's why you're gonna be able to jump them in 10 years quite honestly, right? And if we're not watching out for you and if we're not building you up and selling to you directly as a result of that, we're doing you a tremendous disservice. So I, I love the question that you asked. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn because I, I think you get it. Um, that's gonna be the name of the future is speaking to each generation as the generation, selling to each individual as they are, not as you are. Thanks, Josh. Uh, John, what do you got there? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me uh, learning is data. Um, data used to control everything. If you had the answer, you had the data, you, were, you had the power in the boardroom, you had the power in, in the meeting. And now data is a commodity, right? Everyone has pretty much the same ability to understand, learn from, get the data that a CEO has all the way down to to somebody that has Google, right? And I think that's a very unique situation when you're selling because a lot of people used to be that value add with data or knowledge. And a lot of the times when you're selling to, to your generation, they have the knowledge or will instantly be getting it as you're talking to them about the knowledge, right? And all of a sudden you're, at, you're not as up to date necessarily as you once were. Um, because everybody can kind of kind of get that playing field. So you, you have to connect on different questions. Let me see how you understand this, really get into the partnership and really, you know, understand where their knowledge base is coming from and, and understanding how they got that knowledge. And maybe there's a unique principle or a unique situation that you can go and sell in that particular part. But it, it, is, a, it is a much different sell. You know, back in the day when we had to look at LexisNexis or, or all these other forms of research to get this one thing. Now you can, you know, what is it, chat GPT? I could type in, how do I sell to this person? It's going to give me a better script than I can get, right? So I, I think it's, uh, for me, that's the biggest uh, learning was, you know, you have to really engage in what they know and, and, and understand that that it, it, you guys know and can get the, the data faster than than we could ever imagine, so. Thank you both, appreciate it. How's it going guys, I'm Parker. Um, so as a sales major, I love meeting new people, but one of my like nightmare scenarios is getting into the room with someone who I need to make a good first impression on and then just totally blanking on what I'm gonna say. I was wondering what your guys' prep process looks like when you know you need to make that great first impression. What's the research do before you have that interaction. Do you want to go first? You can go, J Josh. Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't require a lot. You know, at the end of the day, people want authenticity more than anything. So if you're getting nervous and you're blanking, it's because you're trying to project a view of yourself that's different than who you are, right? Even though I've only known you for 10 seconds, I think you're a good guy, right? You just got to come off as you, make an authentic connection, and let the conversation start to migrate from there. If you're 
that worried about it, then, you know, you're overthinking it. It's that authentic connection that drives sales. Yeah, I 100% agree. And some of my best sales calls that I've had, I stumbled and bumbled in the beginning, either made a joke or became vulnerable at that point. And that totally changed the conversation there, right? It, it made that connection. It made it easier to to go from that that point. So, you know, as they always say, no one knows what you're going to say. No one knows where your script is. So if it goes off script, if it goes somewhere different, the only person that knows is yourself, right? So if, if, if you're stumbling and that's, that's who you are, and like you said, Josh, if it's authentic, that person's going to pick up on it right away. And they might even want to help you out, right? In, in my mindset is always that people are of an awesome nature, assume positive intent, be positive. Sometimes when you mess up, they want to help you, right? And that makes it a lot easier to, to have that, like you're saying, selling with indifference, right? They, they want to come and say, oh, but what about this? And you're like, oh, yeah, no, that's great. So I, I think the more candid it is, the more message it is, you want to have it in your mind, you want all the data, all the research, you want to be prepped on, on all of that. Every time I go into it, nobody's going to know where my product, my data, my information better than I am. But the can for me just doesn't work. It, it's going to kind of flow off from that first statement. I'm going to have a good flow, a good script of where I'm going, a good thought process. But yeah, if if it messes up, if, if you go somewhere and you didn't, want to and, and you have to go wait let me time out let me pause let me let me take that back i don't know if that felt right or that didn't hit right um sometimes the best conversations come from that because they know you're being real you're not trying to lie to them this is me this is who i am i'm gonna work 100 percent. and sometimes i'm gonna have errors sometimes i'm gonna mess up a little bit but know that that i'm gonna get you the right information and know that i'm gonna be there for you i think that's a-okay to to have in the back of your head to kind of ease through it um, everybody makes mistakes. They know it, you know it. And when you do, sometimes it brings that human factor into the conversation. It makes that connection a little bit easier. That makes me feel better. Thanks guys. Absolutely. Hi, my name is Jacinzi. Um, thank you guys for coming in first off. Um, so my question is inspired by you, Josh, but I would love to hear from both of you. Um, just talking about your boss um, and what you have learned from them and how they've shaped you and your business. Oh, so the question is, what's Shaq really like? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the thing about Shaquille that a lot of people don't realize is he is the exact same human being that he is on TV. There, it's not a persona. It's who he is. The only difference between him in real life and, and him on TV is he swears a lot in real life and he doesn't swear on TV. That's it. Um, his values were instilled in him from when he was a kid and they still lead him to this day, right? He believes that he has a team of people working with him and everyone plays their own role and we're paid to do a job and it's to do that role with excellence, right? Um, he believes that you can have big fun and still do a tough job. He believes that your life and your family and your job all need to be interwoven in, in one, right? So, I mean, he FaceTimed me a few weeks ago and I was at my son's basketball game. He didn't care I was at the basketball game. He asked me to flip the phone around so he could, you know, see it for a minute, right? That's, that's the guy, right? The guy understands that we're here for a limited amount of time in this world that we want to achieve amazing things with our family, we want to achieve amazing things in our career, and that our world needs to fit together. Um, he's just, he's an unbelievable human being, quite honestly, and uh, it's a privilege that I get to work with him every day. Thank you. So what's your boss like, John? <laughs> I'm not like Shaq. <laughs> No, I think for me, it's it's every boss that I work for makes the job. Um, you know, you'll know in an interview if you're going to connect, if you can work for that person, how you can work for that person, how you can work together. I think it's just so important. So my boss right now is just amazing. She helps me on every day, every bit. She just checks in. She's super, super there for me. And that's what I need as a person, right? I like connectivity. I like being with people. I like connecting. 
So once we had the interview, I knew right away that I, that I could work for this person and I can go above and beyond and, and do anything for her. And that's what I was looking for. So that checked my box that, that I could work for her. Thank you guys. Hi, my name is McKenna, and this is geared more towards John because you said that you are like an expert in like um, improving relationships. And so I'm wondering how that applies to not only like the connection piece, because I feel like that's a really big topic right now. Everybody wants to connect with everybody. But like, how do you do it differently that you call yourself an expert in that category? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think the the main thing that I really try to do anytime I interact with somebody is learn about them, right? Ask questions about them, get really genuinely interested in their life and, and tie it to something that you're genuinely is interested in as well. If, if you can tie your passions together and then put that into whatever you're going to do in business, I think that's just going to exponentially elevate both of your relationships. And once you do that, you can take out any obstacle because you're both working together for a shared purpose, right? For me, a lot of the time, my brother had an adverse event to a medication. So for me talking in, in the medical field and for me talking with people, I want to connect on a patient level. I want to hear their best patient story. I want to hear their best patient. I want to hear something that got them into medicine. And then when we can connect on that level, and then whatever the ask is from there, whatever, whatever we're trying to accomplish, if I can tie it back to, to our passions, we're connected. And we're connected further than any other person that steps in their office because we're connected at whatever that passion point is. So really, I know why I do what I do. And if I can understand why they do what they do and those two things line up, I know we can take out any obstacle, we can work together and it's a win-win situation. And for the ones that we can't, then usually we, we you know, shake hands and, and go separate ways sometimes. But that's how I really try to connect with, with everybody that I talk to. And once I make that connection with them, then we're lifelong friends, lifelong colleagues, lifelong people who can reach out to each other for events or parties or whatever it is to, to really connect because we, we are, you know, uh, passionate about that one subject. Great answer. I'd love to hear from you too. Okay. So I, I've always tried to be the sort of person that's extremely serious about people's business, but not serious about them as an individual or about myself as an individual right? Like you need to have a, kind of a lighter air with people. We once, the stupid example, but like we once went out with this customer who uh, the customer was known for being a real hard ass, like nobody, right? But all through the day, he would drop these little lines, little movie lines from movies like Step Brothers and Anchorman and some of those movies where I'm like, this, this guy, he, he just needs a drink or two in him and he's going to open up big time, you know? And we go out and the whole day we're serious. There's no laughter other than this thing. And we go to the dinner and uh, I, I say to the waitress, I go, uh, hey, just so you know, we're here for his, this is a 55 year old man. We're here for his quinceañera tonight. And the guy loses it, just starts laughing his ass off. And he goes, you're the first person who tried to make me laugh in 15 years. I'm known for being a dick. Sorry for my language, right? Thank you for doing that just now. And then he became one of my really close friends, right? And we ended up growing sales with this customer over 50%, you know, in the next two, three years. You, you need to read the room a bit for sure, right? You can't do that with everybody, but it's, you got to treat their business seriously, but you, you need to treat them like you're more than just a business transaction. Going back to before, it's okay to make people laugh. It's okay for your quirks to come out. It's okay for you to be you. And in exchange for you being you, you need them to be them, right? We're not, none of us are as polished as we pretend we are in the boardroom, right? None of us, right? So you need to let some of the, the jades come out of it. And that's okay. It's okay. And that, that's really what strengthens relationships. In addition to John's answer, which I believe in 100%. Thank you guys so much. Sure.
Um, hi, my name is Katie. Thank you so much for um, taking time out to be here to be here with us tonight. Um, before starting this class, I kind of thought of sales as a skill that people just naturally had and were born with. But I think we're four weeks in now, and I know that's definitely not the case. So I was just wondering what tools do you use now in your careers, like as far as you've come to keep pushing yourself? The first off, the best salespeople I've ever met were like engineering majors in college. <laughs> Dead serious. Because they have like none of the like the view of like, I need this certain personality or I need this or that. They just come in and they're like, here's the data sets and this is what you should do off it. And people are like, well, okay, right? <laughs> you know, makes sense, right? Um, you know, so I don't I don't buy into the whole nature of you're born with that with that personality. I, I really do believe it. There's different types of salespeople. There's some salespeople that are good in some industries. Others are good in other industries. I think though the number one tool, it, it's, it's not a tool as much as it's making sure you're internalizing your experiences as you're going through them and doing the deep dive within yourself as you're in the car driving between calls what worked well, what didn't work well, what lines worked, what lines didn't work, what data points hit hard, what data points missed, all of those things so you could start to build a better and better and better script for yourself, you know, in this and, you know, making sure that you know about people and that you're doing the right uh, customer relationship management. So, you know, hey, this person's worked here for 12 years. He's been married for eight years. He has three kids. He loves the Boston Bruins. He you know, all, all of those things, if, if you put together kind of this notion of how do I minimize the defects in my process, combined with how do I make sure I understand these people even better, you're going to be a killer, regardless of your innate, uh, your innate learnings as a salesperson. Yeah. Man, that was, that was awesome, guys. Yeah, the, the in between the sales calls is amazing. I think the, the cool part nowadays with technology is you can find somebody that you really relate to, right? Whether it's on Instagram, LinkedIn, any type of social media and really learn skills from them. And you could probably find somebody that has a very similar path to yourself that said the same exact thing. Oh, I, I thought it was an eight. I thought this was this. And then when they go through it and, and you can really learn mannerisms we used to have to do ride-alongs right your boss would have to come out with you and then you'd have to get feedback and you'd have to do this and then you'd get you'd wait you know two three days for the report to come in the mail <laughs> and then you get to read it and then you know and then you would improve i think what's so awesome is you can instantly get feedback as you go through right you can you can record yourself like on a zoom call if the person allows you you can have a uh you know, your phone and say, Hey, listen, I'm just trying to get better and, and, and listen to yourself. Right. There's so many different ways now that you could probably even come up with 10 other ways that I'm not even thinking of because I'm not in it as much as you are with the technology. But I mean, I listen to podcasts, uh, sales classes, books on tape, anytime I have flight time, window time, and, and for me, a lot of the people, Jesse Itzler is a great example for myself, love him on Instagram because he goes through his whole sales process of how he sold it to NetJets and how he got the next thing and how he lost money. But that was the greatest, you know, I listen to all those stories and absorb those stories to craft my story and my personal story better. Um, and I, I think it's a, a, an unused portion of social media that you can find somebody and model where you want to go, how you want to do it and, and really learn from them. And I mean, this is the, these classes are awesome. I wish I had those back then too, right. To open up my mind and meet all these people and connect on LinkedIn. Um, so I would say that, that that's what helps me uh, now. Yeah. One thing I'll add is, uh, you know, just thought of this. When I started my career, I was at Procter and Gamble actually living in Boston, not far from where you guys are right now. And uh, they had sales trainers come out and work with all of us when we were like two years in, right? So they, they did like 100 visits all over the country. And we would have to take them on three sales calls. And there was only one thing that they were measuring, although we didn't know this until after. And it was simply put, how many questions did the salesperson ask? Right? Because if you're not asking questions, 
you're losing, right? You're too myopic. You are trying to push your own agenda, not the partnership agenda, right? So literally everything we learned was, hey, it's not necessarily the way it seems. It's it's the way it is, right? And the way it is, is the key to success in selling is by asking, not telling. Thank you so much. How's it going, guys? My name is Joe. I'm a marketing major here. Junior. Um, so I have kind of a two-parter. Um, so I know there's a lot of spontaneity in network building, but I was wondering kind of what are the key factors you look at when you do that? And for the second part, how are your uh, long-term relationships that you've built from those uh, kind of helped you out in your career? You want to start, Sean? Sure. Yeah, for me, networking, I say yes to pretty much everything like that. Yes. Was that Jim Carrey and yes, man. Um, I, I, I think it's a great opportunity to network, learn. You never know where the next opportunity is coming from. Um, connecting with everybody, LinkedIn, alumni parties, New York city, wherever it is. Um, if, if I'm available and I have time, the answer is yes for me. Right. Because I don't know, you could be the, the next biggest thing and you might get an email from me in 10, 15 years from now. And I say, Hey, John Schneider here would love to connect. And you invite me through your door and say, yeah, definitely let, let's do this. Right. So some of, some of my biggest opportunities were, were just that, you know, connecting with people on the way up and they eventually sent, sent their elevator back down. Right. Um, Jesse Itz was a great example for that. Uh, Long Island Syosset boy connected. Uh, and anytime I need some advice, some help, whatever, I can DM him, ask him some questions, and, and he responds, right? Uh, Kevin Connolly, Pat Med alumni. Uh, that's where I graduated from high school. Connected with him, you know, can ask him any questions that I want of, of whatever it is. He will not answer any of the entourage questions, but anything else he, he can connect with, right? So I, I think, A, reach out, put as many connections out there as you can, and, and you'll be surprised who answers and, and who you connect with. And then anybody that's coming up, uh, you know, gratitude and helping is, is the greatest gift of service that you can give. So give back your time because you never know where it's going to go. The next person that you help, for instance, I just – Help somebody at John Hopkins University was with a clinic and I helped her out on this. And all of a sudden she set up the meeting with the CEO uh, two weeks later because she said, hey, he helped me on this little thing. Do you want to go meet and talk with them? That's a meeting that I would have never got with John Hopkins if I didn't meet with this admin that was just having computer issues. So um, you never know where it's going to go. You never know where that person's going to go. And, and, you know, that that's kind of helped me in in my career and networking yeah networking it's really like a currency right you have no idea how it's going to play out only that it's the right thing to do um the other thing i would tell you is and your generation knows this a lot better than than our generation did you're your own brand first and foremost right and the networking you do on linkedin is you developing your own brand right you should be on linkedin trying to engage in dialogue connecting to people you're you have both john and i here tonight if you're not connecting to us by tomorrow you missed an opportunity right you have no idea how that'll play out for you at some point in time and it may not even play out directly through us maybe you see something from one of our connections that all of a sudden helps your brand grow right um it's a currency and it needs to be handled the right way um my whole career, I never tried to burn people. I always tried to do it the right way. So even this past weekend, I was fortunate enough to be in Phoenix for Super Bowl. And the number of people I saw that I hadn't talked to in 10 years, 15 years, but they come running up, give me a big hug, catch up for five, 10 minutes. It's, it's a lifetime of connectivity that you make when you come out into the business world. Um, it, if you view it as a currency and if, if you're careful in how you spend, and also careful in who you allow to spend on you. Thank you guys. Hey guys, uh, Pat, 
senior professional sales major. Um, just one question. Um, relating to the transition from like boots on the ground, account management, like SDR work into sales management, what would you say are like some likes and dislikes about making that transition? And, you know, just like any advice you would have for, for making that transition and when maybe in the career to make that? I mean, it, it's really the same. You know, I, I always viewed sales as like being in the army right? Like just because you're a general doesn't mean you stop thinking like a private. You know what I mean? You, you got to always be thinking about what's going on at the lowest common denominator if you're going to be an effective sales manager and, and sales leader. Um, I used to run a, a multi-billion dollar desk at Anheuser-Busch. I would go out with sales reps four or five days a month because if I don't understand that guy's problem, there's no way I'm going to be good up top, right? Um, you need to be learning from your experience from minute one and just build up as to when to make the move from being like uh, in the car sales rep to sales manager. You know, unless you love being on the ground for me, I, I like the management side way better. And it's just because you can touch multiple points and work with multiple people. I, I like to work with people. I like to lead people. Um, for me, it was natural to try to go that route earlier on in my career, but each person's different. There's not one set way. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah, John, from you as well, would be great. Yeah, I think for me, it, it was, you know, always excel at the role that you have and you always got tapped on the shoulder to, to go to the next role. Um, anytime you win President's Club four, five, six times, people start looking at you in the organization and say, whoa, something, something special here, right? Once is magic, twice is science usually. So, um, you know, if you just drive to that success and then like Josh said, I was, I was always a coach player. I couldn't wait to get out there and, and help and learn. And, and, and once I was a sales manager and then once I was in, in account management, you know, getting out in front of the customer, getting out with the sales rep, learning from them, learning those, those new problems that's that's what I live for, right? I, I'm a salesperson because I can't be stuck in the mundane. I have to have every day different and I have to be surprised every day and I have to be solving some sort of problem if for somebody and make myself useful, right? I'm, I'm the third child, so I need attention. I need to Im impress my parents, right? Like I, I, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning and sales is that, right? So once I got into sales management, once I got into account management and C-suite, getting out and, and, and engaging with it, I, I held the same enthusiasm, the same techniques and, and loved learning from the customers. So I, I think for me, I just went out and said, okay, what's going to impress people? Presence Club four, five, six times. If you do the right things, you're going to get that next opportunity. What are you going to do from there? You're going to get this next opportunity. And I've been lucky enough to be able to do that and be able to get that next step up and then say, okay, what impresses at this level? Let's go out and crush those goals, right? So that, that, that's what helped me make the decision to, to go to the next level for myself. Awesome. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. So my name is Kevin, and I have a question for both of you. Uh, so let's say someone gave you a time machine, and you could go back to the first day you start off um, in this field. What's the top piece of advice you'd give yourselves? I'm definitely letting John go first. <laughs> I need I need a good two three minutes to think about that one. Can, no, we, no. Use a, can we use a time machine now so I could say that first? Or yeah, no? Can we go? Yeah. Can we go? <laughs> Um, I think for, for me, uh, I grew up in a very closed scarcity mindset. Um, first generation to go to university, uh, always told don't go out of the, the cave. It's scary out there. Uh, watch what you do, watch what you say. Don't mess up. You don't want to lose this. Um, if I can go back to myself, I, I could, I, I could say the world's amazing out there. People are here to help you. Um, don't be scared. Don't, don't, don't be nervous that you're going to mess up and lose everything. Um, it's not a three strikes you're out, uh, world and business. Um, some of the biggest opportunities that come from, like I said before, I remember one time I, I literally went into the first, I don't know, probably three days on the sales job. 
my first huge account, got all my papers, everything stacked up, ready to go on my binder. And I fell right in front of the doctor and everything went all over the place. And I just stood there like, ah, I'm never coming back here ever again. Um, that turned out to be one of my best friends in, in, in the medical field. And to this day, we laugh about it, right? So um, I wish I could go back and tell myself that because um, it, it would have at least uh, uh, helped me deal with a lot of the anxiety and the stress that this world is so limited and, and it's so scarce. Um, so if I could go back in a time machine, that, that's, that's what I'd love to tell myself. For, for me, it would really just be this notion, and I, I got to learn this lesson, but not until 10 or 15 years into my career. There, there's this great book called True North by Bill George, right, who used to be the CEO of Medtronic. I really recommend everyone read this book, right, because it really talks about how in the business world, you really should be following your compass and not your clock right? You come out and you're like, I want to be a sales manager by the time I'm 25. And I want to be a director by the time I'm 29. And I, I want to be the youngest vice president in the history of my company. And as a result, you start making like jackass decisions to hit these artificial measures in your mind on what you want to do, right? And what you want to achieve. When you follow your compass, it's more like, what's the legacy I want to leave on this place? What do I want to gain from this place that will better me long term and you know how do I make sure that those two sides are reciprocal um, you know what what makes me feel good about my job versus not good about my job and and am I okay with those trade-offs or not we get so caught up in what's your salary what's your bonus what's your commission what's your this what's your that um, the number of people I know that that now reach my age, and I'm in my mid 40s, right? And they reach my age, and they're like, "I actually have never actually loved a day in my career." And I'm like, "Man, that sucks. That sucks." Some of these guys live in great houses, right? They have great wives, they have great cars, right? And they've never really been happy professionally. That sucks, right? So. And, and it ties back to, to be a truly great salesperson, you need to be passionate about what you're selling, what you're doing, the people you're doing it with. So this notion of, of uh, follow your compass, not your clock, for me, it's everything. But I didn't learn it until I was a vice president, miserable in my company, and said, shit, I need to make a change. Thank you for your answers. Sure. Hey, John and Josh, how's it going? My name is Kevin. I'm a senior majoring in marketing. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I really appreciate you being here on Monday night, uh, bestowing your vast knowledge to all of us. We're very ambitious. Uh, but that being said, because we're so ambitious and we're so chasing our goals, a lot of times uh, we've definitely experienced doubt. So that being said, with both of your experiences, leadership, career, I was just wondering if there's a time or a story that you could tell that maybe you've experienced doubt or the imposter syndrome, and how do you kind of bounce back from that? I live it every day. <laughs> Lovely. You know, it's it's not having doubt or have, be feeling an imposter. It's it's can you overcome that, and can you win the people around you over? Um, when I left Procter & Gamble, I took over Clorox for New England, and the youngest person under me was 12 years older than me, right? And they looked at me and was like, who the hell is this kid? What the hell is he going to teach us? This is stupid, right? And then I went to the Just Born Candy Company, where I was the head of U.S. sales for Mike and Ike, Hot Tamales, and Peeps, right? Yeah, I sold Peeps for a living. Fun fact, right? And... Uh, I get in there and I'm 30 years old and I'm the head of US sales and all of our brokers are in their 50s and 60s. And my whole team, again, the, the youngest one is 15 years older than me. And it's, who the hell is this guy? He's a baby. He shouldn't be here. He doesn't belong. And he's not a candy guy. And you need to be a candy guy in order to be successful in this thing, right? And then I go to the beer business with Anheuser-Busch and how the hell did he get here? He's not a beer guy. He hasn't been in beer his whole life. And then I go into the restaurant world where now I'm selling fast. He's never operated a restaurant. What the hell? Why is he here? He doesn't belong here. And every single time I turn people around, 
And every single time I grew the business and every single time I left a lasting impression on people. And I, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back. All I did was every single day wake up and say, how can I authentically be myself? How can I better myself? And how can I better the people around me? And if people didn't like me, that was okay. And if people didn't want to be around me, that's okay. Right. It's funny. Um, at Anheuser-Busch, they used to say that anyone who was with me 90 days into my role would be with me until I was out of the role. But the number of people who left me in the first 90 days was insane. Right. Because they were so wrapped up in the he's an imposter. He doesn't believe belong here. He never they never stopped to say, hey, if I stay, will I be better? Right. All you could do is say, I'm going to authentically be myself every day. And that won't be OK for some, but it will be for most. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say just uh, one other thing to add. That was awesome, Josh. Um, one other thing to add on that is if you stay hyper focused on what your goals are and how your deliverables are, right? And, and, and you say, okay, these are the things that I'm going to deliver on every day. It gets really easier to focus on those things than trying to go out and, and you know, and impress all these people, right? To, to say, okay, I'm going to be here and I'm going to deliver on X, Y, and Z. These are things that I'm going to focus on. I, I know I'm going to do this. The other thing is mentorship and, and networking and connecting with people. You know, just a quick story. Yesterday, I was in awe. My my son was training in, in baseball and walked into to the facility and there was 22 major league baseball players there. I was like, Oh, should I get a pen? Oh, should I get this? How can I get a signature? He walked straight into the organization. He's 13 years old, went in, went into the cage, went in to do his workout and that was it. And I kind of took a step back and I said, why is he like that? And it's because he's used to being in that environment because he puts himself into that environment and he was dead focused on what he needed to do in that situation, right? So he wasn't looking around like, oh my God, look at all these other people. He was, I need to do my work. I need to get into this situation. I need to go and focus on what I need to focus on, right? And I was at all of that of, wow, because he's in this environment, because he surrounded himself with these people, it's not like a whoa moment, right? For myself, if I'm sitting down with Memorial Sloan Kennery CEO or any of these other people, I get amped up when I see that on my calendar, right? Because that's not an environment that I grew up with, networked in, lived in. So it's very imposterous moment in that, in that, in that thing. So I think the more you can connect, the more you can live in that environment, the more that you can put yourself around those people. When you're in that environment, you don't have that at all. And then when you go focus on your goals and, and you're looking at, okay, I need to do X, Y, and Z, you're just going to be laser focused that, that that's all just going to go away. Um, but I struggle with it all the time, uh, every day as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Last question. Hi, my name is Lillian. I'm a junior majoring in um, management. I was wondering if you could tell us about a time where a, a deal didn't fall through and how you kind of bounced back from it. No. <laughs> it's, uh, the answer though is no, right? Um, I've never been so emotionally attached to a deal where it falling through did me in, right? Um, Right now, we're in the business of restaurant franchising, and when and we only go for big restaurant franchise groups. We're not looking for like onesie, twosie, mom and pops. So you're basically asking somebody to put like $20 million worth of capital against your company in the next five to six years, which is a big ask. It's a big sale. It's way different than selling cans of beer, I'll tell you that much. And as a result, we've gotten to the finish line many times with guys and the deal's fallen apart for one reason or the or another. And I'm very quick to grab my team and say, what did we learn? What do we need to do different? How do we change the process? Keep moving, keep moving. Um, a deal that we lost that my head of franchising was heartbroken on led to us signing the biggest deal in our company history, right? So there's no deal that I've ever looked back on and said, that was the fish that got away. There's none that I had to go drink a couple bourbons to forget. 
it's it's all just an iterative learning process and it's all just you know next next deal up quite honestly yeah and I'll, I'll just add to that awesome statement I, I think you either win or you learn and, and that next deal might come back in two or three years if you're honest and and you tell them hey I can't help you out right now or, or whatever the situation may be that 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 that's how it lost um, a lot of people exactly what you said they they get angry they lie they they don't hold up to their values and then that same deal may come back in another shape or form or that person might move to a different company and you just closed the biggest deal in, in the history because that person became the ceo of that other company and you treated them right when that deal went bad right you said hey listen i i can't help you out at this point these are the best services this is the best that I can do. The, these are all the things that we agreed on. And, you know, I look forward to, to helping you out in the future. And I never lost that deal, right? Because it's it's still open, that, that, that ability to go back to that person. And then the other thing is, is always, uh, I really won't lose, leave a deal uh, unless I ask for referrals. Um, I should be confident in my ability that I brought value to that person. And maybe I didn't get the deal with them. But they should always know two or three other people, hey, listen, maybe this service wasn't good for you or your organization or your company, but there's probably two or three other people that you can think of that I can really help them out. Would you mind reaching out to those? Because if I can get two deals from that one deal, I never lose anything, right? You double your sales. So I, I think that mindset is so critical in, in sales because if you get hung up, like you said, and go out and drink a couple of bourbons, that couple of bourbons will turn into three weeks of a bender and all of a sudden you end up in Vegas, you don't know how you got there. So um this restaurant's virtually in Vegas. So I I know how I got here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah awesome. But but what you're saying, it's absolutely right. And you know, being a CEO is a really weird position because you're simultaneously selling and being sold to every day, sometimes in the same conversation, right? And um, we had two tech companies pitch us and company A, I like the capability more, but company B, I like the sales guy more, right? And we went with company A because in tech right now, salespeople are just flip-flopping and moving around like crazy. Um, but I kept in touch with the rep and ended up passing four clients to him that helped him hit his next quarter. So he won. He still thinks I'm like great friend, everything else like that. And I told him no, Right. So, you know, you have a 40 year career. If you have the right interaction, you, you guys will sell to each other again, right? Um, it's a matter of keeping those relationships in a place where you can sell to each other again. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, John. Thank you, Josh, for popping in tonight. To the Wait, event. no questions from you, Professor? You always ask questions. I don't want so you mentioned two words that were really important uh, to the class. One was authenticity. The other one was curiosity. So we've talked a lot about what authenticity means, but we've also talked about a healthy curiosity and why sales professionals need to have that. So you mentioned earlier on about being authentic and just be you. But that's really simplistic when you think about people that are just going out into the sales force to just be you. So define what authenticity means for 40, you know, undergrads right here that are just going out into the sales force, that word authenticity, and then expound upon the word curiosity. Because in sales, I think that that's one of the most important words. I think, John, you mentioned it earlier, having this healthy curiosity. So I'd just be interested to hear your take on both of those two words. I should have never asked you to ask a question. Sorry, hey. You know, it, it, let's let's start with curiosity, actually. You know, um, one of the best lessons that I got early on in my career. So I, I was living in Boston when I got out of college, but I grew up in New York on Long Island. So I actually grew up a Jets fan. Yeah, I know. Boo, right? Uh, so, you know, the Patriots, they were killing us all during the early 2000s. It was Brady's, you know, big, big, the first three Super Bowls and all that stuff. And our chief commercial officer, he... Um, who was five levels higher than me. He didn't, he barely knew who I was. I was a box on his roster, diehard Patriots fan. And uh, one day we're at a national sales meeting, all watching a football game. And I literally challenged the guy saying the Jets are going to beat 
the Patriots. We were like 20 point underdogs. Jets will beat the Patriots. I'll bet you lunch. Right. And he goes, you're on. I'll take lunch from you. You know, little peon dude, five levels under me. One of my friends was like, what the hell are you doing? Right. Like you're going to owe him lunch. And I go, yeah, but I'm going to get a one on one lunch. Right. We lost badly. Right. He takes me out to some restaurant in Chinatown. He's like, my family will never eat here with me. So you have to eat here with me. That turned into a quarterly lunch for the next five years. Right. Bec and I was able to pick his brain for an hour every single time for five years. What what makes you tick? How did you get to this level? How did you do this? How do I this is a problem I have right now. Uh, how would you overcome it? All of a sudden, this guy way higher than me was looking out for me. It goes back to what John was saying earlier about mentorship. And, you know, now I play that role for people way under me because, you know, if you ride the elevator up, you got to you gotta be there for people as they are and you come back down, right? So curiosity, it's, it's how do you expand this group of people that are looking out for you, right? How do you expand this group of people that will teach you, who will kick your ass in when you need it and pick you up and hug you when you need that? Because you'll need all of it, right? In terms of authenticity, I decided earlier on that I was going to allow my my business maturity to grow, but I was never going to compromise who I was. I was never going to compromise my values, my ethics, my morals, my integrity. I was never going to compromise my personality. I would always crack the bad joke. You know, I would always be the guy where people knew exactly what they were getting. And if you ask any one of my direct reports what they like the most about working with me, they would say. He is the most consistent human being on earth, right? You know you need a coffee in his hand at 8 a.m. If he doesn't get another one at 2.15, you're screwed, right? Like they know everything, right? Because every day I showed up just as me from the time I was 22 years old. And in fact, I, I'm in moments now where like my old bosses are like 65, brink of retirement, and they meet my team and they're like, does he still do this? He does. Does he still do this? He does. I've been the same guy the whole time, right? Authentic, consistent, unapologetically me, done in a way that's suitable for business settings, right? That was, yeah, that, that was amazing. Um, yeah, for, for me, I hit a point in my career where I was okay. Um, but I wasn't being myself at all. And, you know, I, I don't know how many people saw that Jim Carrey thing about living an avatar that, that, you know, you're, you're being somebody else. I, I was being what I thought the companies wanted me to be. And I never reached my full potential. And I'll tell you when the real time was, um, for those that know, know, uh, the healthcare field, this is, this is sometimes a, a no, no, right. When I went to Pfizer at the beginning of my career, they made me shave it. And it was, you know, a big deal. Um, this was my authenticity moment when I, when I grew it back out and I became myself, right? So that was my moment of, hey, this is me. This is what I want to be. Here's what I want to be. I never had a more successful, both financially, family, and, and you know, personally year after I did that because it was me. I, I could be me, right? And, and that's where your potential is going to get unlocked. I had kinetic potential and it, it was there, but or potential and I had to turn it into kinetic, but I, I was held back because of what I thought everybody else wanted to be. And the moment I did that in my career, that's when my career just, just took off because to Josh's point, they knew what they were getting. They didn't know, oh, is he hiding something? He, he sounds like he's just going through the motions. No, I was, I was there. I was making jokes. I was messing up right I was, I was being taking risks going out and going after it and then once you see that success take off um and i think the other thing for for me that was a big learning is, is the curiosity when i got into healthcare that was a passion for mine because my brother's story right so i really wanted to understand and learn a doctor's mindset right and and once you go in, and you go to a doctor and really understand, like, why'd you get into this? Like, how'd you get into this? Why'd you pick this field? What's going on? When you really wanted to get to know that, they, they're teachers by nature, right? Do one, see one, teach one. 
So they want to teach and they want to unload their expertise on you. So once you understood that, it, it just kind of took off and, and you, you had a passion, like I said there before, and it connected to theirs and it was genuine and they can tell, right? You can tell when somebody's just asking questions, they ask questions and you're like, next, like delete. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Um, so I, I think that for me, it was, it's, if you find a passion or find something you're really good at and then connecting that to the sales world, whatever it is, right? Because every single industry needs salespeople. Um, even if you're not in a sales function, you're a salesperson. Um, you, you're, you're building your brand. Like Josh said before, you're selling you. So you're, you're going to need these skill sets and the people that have these skill sets always rise to the top of every organization because they, they really truly care about people and they truly care about making connections. And, and that, that's what's a key to business, right? It's, it's making connections. So I think those are the two things that, that helped me when I really, I hit, I don't want to say rock bottom, but I, I hit a spot in my career where I was like this, I can't do this for another 40 years. Um, and then when I, when I became me, that that's when I really knew that th this was for me. With, with your guys' generation, just going back to the question from earlier and what John just said triggered it, this whole notion of authenticity and curiosity, it really comes back to the one main question, which is, are you on brand? Yes or no? And by on brand, I don't mean the brand you're selling. I mean you. You're your own brand, right? So everybody you meet, they're going to they're gonna change you a little bit. They're going to mentor you. They're going to teach you. They're going to kick your butt. They're going to do all sorts of stuff. And the people that are growing your brand and are building you up, they're the best, right? Those are the people you want to be around. The people that are off brand, trying to drive you off brand, those are the people you got to get away from. And that may mean changing companies, industries, careers, whatever. But if you view yourself as a brand, what do you need to do to stay on brand? Being curious, being humble, being authentic, all help you stay on brand. It's all towards managing towards True North, that book I mentioned earlier, right? Following your compass to stay on brand. 